This week on Christian World News, revival in North Africa. In the past 20 years, thousands of African Arabs have given their hearts to Jesus Christ. And a message from the Vatican. Pope Francis sends a clear signal that bishops living a lavish lifestyle should follow the example of Jesus. Plus, the real story behind the movie that is blowing the competition out of the water. We'll take you inside Noah's Ark. Welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. A Christian revival is touching the northernmost reaches of Africa. Once hostile to the gospel, now tens of thousands of Muslims are following Jesus. George Thomas brings us this exclusive story. These images of North Africans worshiping have never been seen before on television. As the sun sets over the Mediterranean Sea, Muslims across this part of Africa are converting to faith in Jesus Christ in record numbers. What God is doing in North Africa, all the way from actually Mauritania to Libya, is unprecedented in history of missions. Tino Kahush, a graduate of Regent University, has spent years traveling the region to document the transformation. I have the privilege of recording testimonies and listening to first-hand stories of men and women all ages where they can be sitting in a room and see the appearance, the presence of God appear to them in reality. It's like a vision. They can, some of them gave me stories of they carry a conversation. It's not just a, a light that appears. His interviews confirm what experts say is a profound move of God in the predominantly Muslim nations of Mauritania, Western Sahara, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia. Sometimes I feel jealous. How come is visiting the Muslim world at this time and age where we don't hear that happening in the traditional Christian community? From the shores of Casablanca in Morocco to Tripoli, Libya, experts say the growth of Christianity especially in the last 20 years, has been unprecedented. And nowhere is that growth more evident than in the North African nation of Algeria. Pastor Salah leads one of the largest churches in Algeria, where 99% of the population is Muslim. He says every new Christian in his church came from a Muslim background. Some 1,200 believers attend the church. Men like Zino, who was invited to attend Pastor Salah's church by a friend. Others like Farhat speak of miraculous encounters. He says he was illiterate and couldn't read the Bible when he accepted the Lord. Then God made a change. Even though Algeria is overwhelmingly Muslim, the government has given Protestant churches the freedom to register their congregations. It is the first Muslim Arab government who recognized officially churches from Islam. Yusuf Kurahmani is a leading Algerian pastor. He says the government will harass and intimidate Christians from time to time, but the level of persecution is nothing like it was 20 years ago. God has given to us many opportunities to witness at the police stations, at the courts. And actually, once I, I, I went to the police station and they gave me 45 minutes to speak about Jesus. Just imagine yourself, they are all Muslims. City, well, tell us about Jesus, please. But Algeria and the countries of North Africa weren't always open to the gospel. Peter is a veteran missionary in these parts. You know, there's that parable, the sower went out to sow and his, the seed fell on uh, stony ground. This is North Africa. Uh, in those days was quite uh, resistant and stony. For security reasons, we've altered his voice and concealed his identity. The religion and the culture were unsympathetic to anything that was foreign and uh, Christianity was considered to be a 
the religion of the Europeans. Peter believes the arrival of satellite TV and the internet have dramatically changed people's perception of Christianity. Today in North Africa on, on TV you can hear uh, native Arab Christians talking about their faith who are mature Christians, answering questions, involved in debates. Emboldened by God's power, Algerian Christians are now on a mission to take the gospel to the four corners of the globe. God has put, put in our heart to be able to send 1,000 missionaries by the year 2025. And I really believe maybe one day America will end up with some Muslim converts, missionaries coming to reach out to the Muslims there and other parts as well. George Thomas, CBN News, along the shores of the Mediterranean. Beautiful. Thanks, George. Pastor Saeed Abedini's wife says he's doing better now that he's getting some medical treatment. That's her husband. The American pastor has been jailed in Iran for 18 months. He was recently transferred to a hospital for treatment of his injuries he suffered in prison. His wife, Nagme, told Faith Radio that her husband is finally receiving decent meals and pain medication, but she says he still needs surgery. Well, more than two million Syrians have fled the fighting in their country. Many are living terrible conditions in tent cities that lack even the basic necessities of proper food, clothes, and clean water. Christians are showing God's love to these hurting people by reaching out to help. CBN's Efren Graham spoke with Patrick Klein of Vision Beyond Borders about their work among the refugees. Patrick, tell us about the conditions of these camps and the conditions there. Uh, what we saw in the urban refugees in Amman, Jordan, was the 20 to 30 people living in a one-room apartment, sharing one bathroom, one small toilet. But then in the tent cities, people just had very little necessities. It was very cold. It was, uh, there was a lot of mud, and, and it was just very really primitive conditions. Now, your group, Vision Beyond Borders, is working through local partners to provide the much-needed assistance. Tell us about that. Right. We, actually, when I went there the first day, we, went to, we helped about 200 families. And these were Christian families from Christian backgrounds. And we gave them blankets and uh, mattresses, pillows, and then they had clothes and then also food and little heaters. Mm -hmm. And then the next day we went to the tent city and we helped 185 Muslim families, giving them little wood stoves and some blankets and mattresses as well. Well, now we're hearing you're providing the basic needs they need there, but they have deeper needs than just the basic necessities of life. Tell us about that. Well, a lot of them are from our actually opening the gospel. They're mm -hmm. searching and they're saying, you know, we're seeing these militants kill our people and run us out of our country. And they're saying, you know, here's Christians coming in and bringing aid to us. We want to know why are the Christians different? Mm -hmm. And it's just been a great opportunity to minister the gospel to them. Well, now you're actually printing 40,000 Arabic language Bibles to give to refugees. What do you hope to accomplish with that? We're hoping to see the church really grow. Um, many of them are searching and they're asking, for, they're asking for the truth. And so as we provide scriptures to them and they read the word of God and we have people to follow up with them and work with them, we're hoping to see many of them come to faith in Jesus Christ. Are you seeing some of that already? We are. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting. The people are finding hope. And when I was there, we went to the refugees in, in, uh, in Amman. And the lady that took us there was from Islamic Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And we said, can we pray for people? And she said, yes. And I said, in the name of Jesus. And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. And every family, they were grateful for prayer. Nobody refused prayer, even though they were all Muslims. Mm -hmm. Can you share one testimony? Well, it's just, um, I remember going into, this This lady was living down in the basement, mm -hmm. and her son was laying on the ground, and I think he'd been hit by shrapnel. And we went to see her conditions. It was implorable, very, very cold. So they had a big snowstorm. And we were able to pray for that lady, and then we laid hands on her son and prayed for her son, and she kept kissing our hands and thanking mm -hmm. us for coming. I just think that they see Jesus through the Christians' activities and ministry to them. Patrick Klein, Vision Beyond Borders, thank you so much for your time, and God bless your efforts. Thank you. God bless you. And if you'd like to help Vision Beyond Borders bring Bibles to Syrian refugees, just go to our webpage. You'll find a link to their ministry at cwnews.org. And up next, Pope Francis sends a warning to some high-living church leaders. Repent or be replaced. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. 
I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. A cell phone video message from Pope Francis to charismatic Christians in the U.S. has gone viral, and it started what some religious leaders are calling a new era with a branch of the Protestant Church. The Pope recorded a video greeting in January to a clergy friend with ties to Kenneth Copeland Ministries in Texas. Copeland played the message to a gathering of ministry leaders and pastors. Hmm. The Pope asked the church leaders to pray for him, adding he will pray for them as well. Well, days after the Pope removed a German bishop for his lavish lifestyle, the Archbishop of Atlanta is apologizing for building a mansion costing more than $2 million. But that only, but that only came after local parishioners expressed outrage at the price tag on his new home. Charlene Aaron reports. I think when you're in politics or religion, you are called to a different light and you have to live differently. You represent all people. That's the sentiment of many Catholics across Atlanta when it comes to this $2.2 million, 6,000 square foot home, the new residence for Archbishop Wilton Gregory. In letters, emails, and a meeting, local Catholics told the Archbishop the price tag for his new home was outlandish. I think that the Pope has set the precedent of how we should live, and I think it's simply. The house, located in one of America's wealthiest neighborhoods, includes two dining rooms and an elevator. Church officials say Gregory needed a new home after giving up his residence near the cathedral, where parish priests will now stay. The new residence was built using funds from a $15 million gift from the nephew of Margaret Mitchell, author of the Civil War epic, Gone with the Wind. That gift was to be used for general religious and charitable purposes. But the archbishop demolished a one-story home that Mitchell had donated and replaced it with a Tudor style mansion. Pope Francis has asked us to be particularly concerned about the poor and the disenfranchised who make up a large majority of the Catholic Church. And that was one of the biggest concerns of the parishioners of Christ the King who were so disappointed. Pope Francis has made it clear that he expects his priests and bishops to follow his example of modest living, imploring them to refrain from driving fancy cars and denounce the idolatry of money. Gregory has now apologized, saying, I failed to consider the impact on the families throughout the archdiocese, who, through struggling to pay their mortgages, utilities, tuition, and other bills, faithfully respond year after year to my pleas to assist with funding our ministries and services. Pope Francis recently removed a German bishop for spending $43 million on a new residence. 
And in New Jersey, churchgoers are criticizing Archbishop John Myers after he spent half a million dollars to add a pool, fireplaces, and other luxuries to his home. Gregory says he will begin the process of selling the mansion. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Up next, feeling confused by the recent movie about the story of Noah? This biblical scholar straightens it out and takes us right inside the ark. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey, kids, do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah! Well, do you? Yeah! Then you're going to love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. CBNNews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNNews.com at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News. The source for your news, CBNNews.com. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. The story of Noah only takes up a few chapters in the Bible, and the main character barely speaks at all. So there is room for creative liberties, but critics of the new movie say the director took them too far. So Scott Ross sat down with one author who gave him the real story behind Noah's Ark. <gasps> Noah, what did he say? He's going to destroy the world. Last weekend, the story of Noah and the Ark made another epic passage from the pages of the Bible and history to Hollywood's big screen. Director Darren Aronofsky's crew and all-star cast convincingly recreated the world of Noah's time. The film's creators acknowledge they took artistic license with the biblical narrative, a process they didn't take lightly. So we had to try and figure out how to tell the story, be faithful to what is in the Bible, explicitly, and then um, figure out how, how to address those tantalizing questions. Action! In fact, several well-known evangelical leaders have endorsed Aronofsky's film. They say overall, the movie reflects the themes of justice and mercy found in scripture. Run. I recently spoke with Larry Stone, author of Noah, The Real Story, who shared some insights on the film and the Genesis account. The Bible says that the, God destroyed the world because of the evil of mankind. Right. The movie tends to define that evil as environmental destruction. And so Noah is, Aronofsky said, the first environmentalist. I don't think that we should get all bent out of shape because it doesn't follow the Bible closely. Okay, in the spirit of artistic interpretation, that seems fair. Aronofsky deserves credit where his pre-flood world in Genesis agreed. It was violent. One translation said, evil, evil, evil. Men and women thought of nothing but evil, morning, noon, and night. And God repented that he had made man and said, I'm going to destroy the evil that I see on the earth. And Noah was a righteous man. And God said, build an ark for the saving of your family. I saw water, death by water. That's on your life. A great flood is coming. 
We build a vessel to survive the storm. Using a set and digital imaging, the filmmakers created an ark with the same dimensions found in the Bible. The ark was 450 feet long, uh, 75 feet wide, uh, 45 feet high. It was uh, time and a half of a football field and half was wide. The largest wooden ships ever made were probably the Chinese treasure ships back in the 1400s. And these were as long as the ark and slightly wider. And there are records of them traveling all over the uh, Far East. How long did it take Noah to build it? 60 to 80 years. Did he have help? The Bible doesn't say. Undoubtedly, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, his sons helped, but he could probably have employed others to help too. And what did they know about technology then? I mean, saws, hammers, nails, how was it actually assembled? We tend to think that people back in the ancient times didn't have the ability to do the things we did. But look at the pyramids. So they certainly had some technology. It begins. People always ask, how did Noah get the animals? The Bible simply says God brought them. How many animals approximately were in the ark? Is there any way of estimating that? There is. The key there is after their kind. Does kind mean species? Well, there's between three and 30 million species. Or does kind mean family? So did Noah have to take a dachshund and a schnauzer and a wolf? Or did he have to take two animals representing the dog wolf family? Generally speaking, the most he would have had to have on the ark is 16,000 animals, which is a lot, but they could have fit. Let me tell you a story. There are over 300 flood stories around the world, all over the world, from Australia to India to Greece to South America to North America. Is it because they borrowed from one another? Some people say that the Noah story borrowed from the Gilgamesh epic. Or perhaps these stories are all a collective memory of one great worldwide flood. Now, people are going to say you talk about God being love. Yes. How does that equate with a God who said, I'm going to destroy every man, woman, child, animal on this planet? Because I think that we tend today to attribute to God only the attribute of love and don't realize that God is holy and cannot countenance sin, so that the evil in us is repugnant to God, even though he loves us. Now, God made a covenant with Noah then and said he would never again destroy the world with water. Right. Just as the ark saved Noah and his family and certain animals, at that time, the cross of Jesus Christ is what saves us today. And the only solution to our evil is the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. That's why he came the first time to die. He's the ark. He's the ark, <laughs> yes. While the Bible doesn't say how Noah's family survived a year adrift, the box office Noah saw plenty of drama. I've seen it, but I'm going to reserve my comments so you can see it for yourself. Well, we'd like to hear your take on the new Noah movie. Does it take the Bible story too far? Is it an opportunity to share the truth about sin and redemption, or is it just good entertainment? You can join the debate on our Christian World News Facebook page, and we'll be right back. Come on, Give me that. <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there providing food thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I joined CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hi, good morning. Are you ready to get started? The Bible says that God speaks in the visions of the night. The question for us today is, does God still speak in our dreams? Can God use our dreams to warn us 
instruct us, inspire us, call us to pray, and build our faith. In Gordon Robertson's newest DVD teaching, Visions of the Night, you'll discover how God used dreams throughout the Bible, how to know if a dream is from God, what to do when God speaks to you in dreams, and how to understand the plans God has for you. Dreams can tell us what God wants us to do. You can dream of the good works God has created for you and find the satisfaction in life that only He can provide. Get CBN's newest DVD teaching, Visions of the Night. It's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. Available now. In Costa Rica's mountainous coffee country, Christians recently joined forces to offer their neighbors free health care and entertainment, along with a life-changing message. Stan Jeter reports. They called the festival Republic of Joy, and organizers shared plenty of joy with the people of Turrialba, including free health care. The goal is to preach the gospel. Uh, to let them know about Jesus. So the social side of the festival is just a way of getting to people. We bless them, we love them, we show them the love of Christ through what we do for them. The whole idea is preaching the gospel to them. It's about Jesus. First, we give something to the community. We believe people don't have to listen if you don't give them something in exchange. Over 20 Christian churches and ministries provided volunteers and services. They joined a full team of evangelists, whose impact was felt throughout the city. It's very important that we have quite a few evangelists because they have complementary gifts. What one does, the other doesn't. And as they come together in this role, we can reach the entire city. We can go to schools, we can go to prisons, we can go into the churches, we can go into the parks. Some people have the gift of personal evangelism, others have it in mass. You put that all together and you have a powerful force. Turrialba's youth turned out for skateboarding and BMX bike riding exhibitions. The job of this ministry is to catch the attention of the youth who are in the streets and enjoy sports, skates, skateboarding and BMX. And other public events drew entire families whose children danced to the Poem of Salvation song, along with Gizmo the robot from CBN's Superbook cartoon series. And church volunteers were there when people responded to the invitation to follow Christ, an opportunity given during each of the festival's many events. This is not the work of uh, one man. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in, in collaboration with all the evangelists. A work that Turrialba's churches expect will last for years to come. Stan Jeter, CBN News. Thank you so much, Stan. It's a Great work they're doing there in Costa Rica, and they've got some great coffee there as well. I'd love to visit. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on Christian World News. Until next week, goodbye. And from all of us here, God bless you.